Hello Cloud Gurus, I'm Nigel Poulton and welcome to this month's episode of Kubernetes This Month. As usual, we'll skip through the major announcements from the month in our quick catch-up section. Then, we'll dive deeper into some of them in our deep dive section. And we'll finish things up with a Guru of the Month. So, make sure you're comfortable and get ready to enjoy. Okay, honestly, there's been loads going on this month. And we've got to start with KubeCon. So, KubeCon 2019 in San Diego just happened, and as you'd expect, it was bigger and better than ever. But we'll park that for now though, and talk about it more in our deeper dive section. We also had loads of announcements relating to GKE, the Google Kubernetes engine. Now, among those were a GA announcement for the vertical pod autoscaler, and also a GA announcement for node auto provisioning. Rancher Labs announced GA for K3S, or keys, depending on how you like to pronounce it, and we're gonna talk about that in the deeper dive section as well. Moving to Helm, we have finally got a version three release. Now, we've talked about the development of Helm 3 a lot in previous episodes, so it is really good to see that hit the community, and well done there to everybody. Istio announced a 1.4 release, there's a bunch obviously going on in the Istio space at the moment, and in this release, one of the things we got is automatic MTLS. Now, right now, this needs to be manually enabled. So the automatic MTLS needs to be manually enabled, but you know what? Once it is enabled, it is all automatic from there. Now, on the topic of Helm and Istio, both projects are currently trending in the fastest growing open source projects based on number of contributors. So extra confirmation there is if we didn't already know it, but that there is a ton of good stuff going on in those projects. Envoy, the ever popular proxy given to us originally by Lyft and used pretty much everywhere by all of the top service meshes, that got a 1.12 release. Solo, they just released version 1.0 of their Glue Enterprise product. That's the enterprise-grade version of their API gateway. Vitess, the scalable cloud-native database, that graduated the CNCF. And you know what? That is no small feat. In fact, it is only the eighth project to graduate so far. So huge congratulations. Scaffold is now GA, which if you're not familiar with Scaffold, it's all about automating as much of the operation stuff involved in deploying and managing cloud native apps on Kubernetes as possible, right? So things like updating and maintaining images and manifests and all of that stuff, right? That can be done by Scaffold, letting you focus more on your apps. Rancher Labs again, their Longhorn persistent storage solution for your stateful apps that's been accepted into the CNCF as a sandbox project. So exciting times there. Now, this is one that I'll be watching, right? Because managing stateful apps is something that's increasingly important for Kubernetes. Cloud events, which is basically a spec for describing serverless events in a common standardized way, that moved from sandbox to incubator within the CNCF. And last up in this month's quick catch up section, Mirantis has acquired Docker's enterprise platform and its enterprise business unit. And we'll talk more about that in our deeper dive section. Okay, so in this month's deeper dive section, we'll look at KubeCon, K3S from Rancher Labs, and Mirantis acquiring Docker Enterprise. Okay, so KubeCon and CloudNativeCon hit the warm, sunny beaches of San Diego. And as we mentioned, it was bigger and better than ever. Overall attendance topped 12,000, with around 8,000 making it into the opening keynote. Now, of interest was the fact that around probably two thirds to three quarters at the keynote were first time attendees, and a lot of those were pretty new to Kubernetes. So a lot of people climbing aboard the good ship Kubernetes. And you know what? A lot of those are from the more traditional enterprises. And I felt right, a lot of people from more of a 
kind of infrastructure and operations background. Now, as opposed to previous KubeCons, where there's often felt like a major theme running throughout the conference, this one didn't have that feel. But I did get a sense of a couple of subtle themes. First up, we've been talking about service mesh for ages, right? But it's starting to feel like we're getting real adoption. Now, that's due to some of the things that we've talked about on previous episodes of this, right? So, I mean, Linkerd and Istio have both gotten way easier to deploy and work with. But as well, the hosted Kubernetes platforms on the major clouds, they are making it really simple to deploy a mesh these days. So I feel like we're starting to see real adoption of service meshes, and you should seriously be considering meshes for your environment. Now, I also felt that KubeCon, like a lot of projects and technologies, are getting stable or GA releases. So KubeCon is getting bigger with lots of noobs in attendance here, service meshes are starting to be adopted, and tons of things are going GA. Now to me, that just proves that Kubernetes is maturing nicely. Now then, K3S, sometimes pronounced keys, let me tell you, this is cool but it's also a serious project to check out and one to keep an eye on. Now, the original idea was for K3S to be a lightweight Kubernetes distribution for IoT and edge use cases. So think like small binary size with a low memory footprint and all of that jazz, right? And that is exactly what it is, only it is becoming way more than just for the edge. Because the thing is, the community absolutely love it and they're using it all over the place, not just the edge. So why do people love it so much? Well, for starters, right, it's lightweight, like 40 or 50 meg, but it's also fully certified. So you're getting the full and proper Kubernetes experience, just super small, super easy to install, and it is production grade. I started my personal interest when I wanted a fully working Kubernetes cluster on my laptop, because as cool as Minikube and Docker desktop were, they were just single node, right? With everything running on a single master, even my user apps. And as cool as that is, it is nothing like the real world. So I started to play a bit with K3S to get a multi-node cluster on my laptop. And a lot of people did the same. But now, seriously, people are using this everywhere. And with things like an HA control plane and the whole thing going GA, I am telling you, this has the potential to be one of the leading production grade Kubernetes distros out there. And it's so simple. I highly recommend you check it out. Okay, last up before we do our guru of the month. Docker sells its enterprise range of products and its enterprise business unit to Mirantis. So exciting times ahead for Mirantis and their customers as they build out their product portfolio. But for us right now, I want to address the overall Docker situation. So first and foremost, our best wishes to any and all staff who are affected by this situation. We wish you the very best. But for the wider Docker technology, and I'm talking about the low level container runtime yet yeah, that changed the world for us, well, that marches on. So Docker Inc, okay, they've secured $35 million in funding to keep operating and their focus is gonna be on developer tooling and workflows. But the Docker project, I mean, that's open source, right? So that means, I guess like Linux, it can exist and thrive outside of a commercial company kind of owning and managing it. And that was always the intention. The folks behind Docker always wanted the core container runtime to be owned and developed by the community. So, Yes, lots have changed with like the way the business is structured and where people work and who owns what on the commercial product side. But the core Docker container technology, that remains as is. So a thriving open source project that is key to so much that we do today in the cloud native world. And that wraps up our deeper dive section. Okay, guru of the month, will it be you? Last month we asked, how do we inject service mesh sidecars into pods on our Kubernetes clusters? And the answer was A, via a mutating admission controller. And our winner this month is 
Moritz Graf, a DevOps engineer from Regensburg, Germany. So well done Moritz and you'll be getting a goodie bag in the post. And of course as well, thanks to everyone who pitched in with answers. I love it, right? Anyway, this month's question is live in the forum link below. And seriously, if you think you know the answer, have a go and get involved. Live a little, yeah? Put yourself to the test. You might even enjoy it. And on that note, you know the drill by now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you again next month. Same cube time, same cube place.